I hope you're excited, and um, I'm not sure if, if everyone here, I'm sorry, let me just make sure this is recording. I'm not sure if you got our text. Uh, this is a month of celebration. The Lord has led Pastor Maurice to have, to, to have the theme for our churches that we're going to celebrate. Now, we're not just celebrating because it's December, we're celebrating because this is what God wants for us. The question is, why do we celebrate? Celebrating or celebration is always used to remember something. It's always used to put the good things before your mind. Why? Because it is so easy to forget. We live in a world where uh, Satan and other people want us to forget about the goodness of God. And the only way to keep the goodness of God before our hearts, one of the ways to do that, we have to celebrate. God's goodness is meant to be celebrated. Not just Black History Month. Not just Christmas. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons why we celebrate Black, Black History Month is because we live in a country that is racist, or it's not really a, a racist country, but we live in a country that practices the art of racism, right? We have people here who have an issue with your skin color. So they come up with this idea saying, you know what? Since they have this issue with how we look and how we move and how we dress and how we act, we're going to have to have a holiday where we remember the, uh, the, the victories or the work of people of color. So this is why celebration is so, so important, is to remember. Even a Christmas holiday, where the word Christ is in the holiday, but Christmas is meant to remind us of Christ's gift. I know people say it's pagan and we have a different debates about that. Let's put that to the side for a moment. And let's remember for Christians, we celebrate Christmas to remember the goodness of God. It is so easy to forget how God has been good to you. It's so easy to forget what God had done in the past. I find it astounding and interesting that the children of Israel had just been delivered from Egypt. They're coming out of strong bondage. They're coming out of slavery. They're coming out of a nation that is killing their children. God delivers them. He takes them through all these signs and wonders. They get to the wilderness and something weird happens. It seems like they forget and now they're crying to go back, which is com that's weird. You just saw the miracles of, the first, of God destroying the firstborn. You saw all the signs. And how is it that you forgot what God has done for you to the point where you say, you know what? We don't want this anymore. We want to go back. We would rather be back in slavery. They were remembering the good food that Egypt had, but they seemed to have forgotten how they were mistreated. And this is why God is saying, please, please, my people, remember the goodness of God. Even marriages, sometimes in being married, you can tend to forget why you got married. That's why I tell people sometimes when I, when I do um, pre, um, premarital counseling, marriage counseling, I think divorce is weird because how is it that you forgot that this person was your friend? How do you, how do you forget so quickly? You started out as friends, you were lovers, having good sex, and all of a sudden, I can't stand this person anymore because we have forgotten so quickly. So God wants us to remember. So celebration, the purpose of celebrating is to remember. For the believer, we celebrate the goodness of God. Amen? And I've taken time out to prepare this message for you because uh, we at Winners Church truly believe and honor the Word of God. We know that the Word of God is power, and the Word of God has the power to set free. We're only saved. We're only born again because of the Word of God. And there are some nations where people are weeping crying for the word of God because they know without that word there is no deliverance without that word there is no power so I've taken time out to really get into the word so I can give you God's word for you concerning celebrating in Jesus precious name amen so I want to begin by with this scripture that says in Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 20 he is your praise he is your God who has done for you these great and awesome things which your eyes have seen. God has done a great and awesome thing for you. One of the things he has done for you, he has sent Jesus, as my wife has stated, Jesus has come to die for your sins. And through his blood, you are set free. Through his blood, you are justified. Through his blood, you are no longer condemned. That means if you messed up yesterday, you messed up tomorrow, it doesn't make a difference. You are always, always justified. For some people, that's hard to accept. But God knows the human nature. God knows what the human nature needs. And he says, my blood will always cover them. So let's celebrate and let's remember that the awesome thing that God has done for us is giving Jesus Christ for us to die for our sins, that we can be set free in Jesus' name. Amen? amen. Now, I want to go. Now that I got that out of the way, amen? Thank you, Father, for your grace and your mercy. 
We're going to, today, the title of today's message is Celebrating the Value That God Has Given You. Celebrating the value that God has given you. We live in a world where people do not truly understand the value that God has given humanity. We live in a world where not only do people not understand, but people want to suppress your value. They want to base your value on a paycheck. They want to base your value on what have you completed this year. They want to base your value on what you're doing or not doing with your life. And God is saying that is not how you're to determine your value. Your value is determined by what God has spoken about you. Your value is determined by how God has made you. Your value is determined. Your worth is determined by how God sees you. So this is why the Bible says that when Satan came to Jesus, something powerful happened. He came to Jesus and he said, if you are the son of man, he said, if. If you are, the, I mean, the son of God, not son of man. If you, if you are the son of God, do this. Jesus, knowing his value, knowing the value of the word, he said, um, one of the things he said to Satan was, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That means that our value is based on the word where God has spoken, and that's how we are to live. That means that if God's word says I'm great, I'm great. If God's word says I'm worthy of being a millionaire, I'm a millionaire. If God's word says that I can be a soul winner, and I've been qualified to win souls, though my past is not the best, though my past is not as great, but if God has said that I can do these things, then I am valuable enough and worthy enough to do these things. And this is why it's so important for us to live off what God's word has said. Too many people have made the mistake of forgetting the goodness of God's word. And my prayer today is that you will not forget that, that what God's word has said about you, that you will not forget how God has declared you to be valuable, how God declared you to be worthy. Why would Jesus die for you if you're not worthy? Why would Jesus die for the world if the world is not worthy enough? God, Jesus saw the world as worthy enough to go through the torture, to go through destruction, to go through all that he went through because he saw the worth and value in mankind. And I want you to remember this and celebrate this, that you are valuable based on what God has spoken about you. Amen. One of the people in the Bible that forgot their value is Eve. And I'm explaining to you why. The Bible says in Ephesians, I mean, not Ephesians, Genesis chapter 3. Let's start here. Now the serpent, uh, this is Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 to 6. Genesis chapter 3. Verse 1 to 6. I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said you should not eat of every tree of the garden? One of the ways the devil works is, if you see in the scripture, the devil never commanded Eve to eat from the fruit. The devil can't make a command to you as a believer. Maybe one who is under him, but as a believer, the devil cannot make a command to you, but he can make a suggestion. He can question you. And you find here that when you read this story here with Satan, when he's talking to Eve, in verse 2 he says, and in verse 3, when he talks to her, he brings up that if she eats from this tree, she'll become like God, knowing good and evil. The reason why I'm bringing that out because Satan was able to turn Eve to focus on what she has or what she doesn't have. And that's how the devil works. He's trying to get you to look at yourself when it comes to your value. Look at your skin color when it comes to your value. The reason why you're not hired because of your skin color or the reason why you don't have this home because they're saying you as a people group are struggling and you're not going to get a home. That's what Satan wants to do. He tries, he works through deception to get you to focus on yourself. If you're married or you're in a relationship, he'll try to get you to look at yourself and get you into competition with the person you're in a relationship with. This is how Satan works. This is his master plan to deceive humanity, to look at yourselves. Look what you don't have or you do have. Just look at yourself for a moment. And God is saying, don't look to him. Don't look to yourself, but look to me. Your value is based on what I have said or spoken to you. And in verse two, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the free eat of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you should not eat it, nor should you touch it, lest you die. I just want to take a, a quick side note. In verse 2, God told Adam, do not eat from the tree. Eve said that God said you should not touch it, lest you, let, you should not touch it, not, neither eat it, lest you die. Now, God never said don't touch it. The reason I'm bringing this out because we're seeing here before the fall 
there's an issue of miscommunication already. Before Eve entered into sin, there's already a miscommunication going on. It's not abnormal to be in a relationship and there's a miscommunication between you and your um, significant other or your friendships, whatever it is that you have. It's not uncommon that my wife says one thing and I hear something different. This is something that is sometimes normal, and this is why in relationships we have to work over time to really understand one another because the enemy will use that to turn, each, uh, to turn ourselves against each other. I mean, Adam tells her one thing, and Eve heard something completely different. And this is before the fall. And I find that fascinating that even before the fall, miscommunication is already inside the, um, in, is in the book of beginnings, in the book of be- beginnings. So I want to encourage you that no matter what is being communicated between you and your spouse, always take time to understand one another. It is so crucial. Ma- John Maxwell has said that there's always a difference between what's being said and what's being heard. And that's why you got to work overtime to really say, okay, this is what I heard you say. What did you mean by that? What does this mean? Now, uh, now when going, going back to Eve in the, uh, in the scripture in Genesis chapter, ch- chapter 4, then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die for God knows in the day you eat of, it, eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God knowing good and evil. So the woman, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of his fruit and ate it. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. The reason why I'm bringing out this story is because Satan was able to trick Eve into thinking she was lacking something. She's lacking, um, you're not, you don't have the wisdom. You don't have the understanding. You don't have what you need. So you need to disobey God and get it for yourself. Eve thought God was holding out on her. Eve thought God kept something from her. If you look at the book of Genesis, it said that they were already made in the image and likeness of God. Yet Eve, um, Satan has said, you're not made in the image and likeness of God. You're not enough. You need to eat of this tree. And right then in here, we find a breakdown of someone's value. And this is what's happening to many of us today. When we are struggling with our value, it's because Satan has sowed a seed in us to think or make us question our value in God. And I have a question for you. How much of our lives are based off of Satan's deception? How many of our decisions are based off of what Satan has said to us? How much of what we're doing is based off of what Satan had deceived us with. And it's so important for us to look to God's word because if we do not look to his word, we're going to continue to be deceived. We're going to continue to be tricked. We're going to continue to have our eyes shrouded or covered from what God is telling us. This is why Jesus said, live off the word of God. Don't live over other doctrines. Live off the word. Don't live off of social media. Live off the word. Because I know on social media, there's a lot of stuff that's going around, a lot of ideologies, ideas, schools of thoughts. I understand it. I look at it all the time. But I do not live off of that. I live based on what God has said to me. I don't live off my past. Thank God that we had a past that God has delivered us from, but not even our past determines our value. Not even the degree you have determines your value. It's what God has said about you. It's what God has determined about you. So I want to encourage you to look to what God has said about you. And don't just look to it. You need to take time to study it. You need to take time to meditate on it. You need to take time to have it rooted deep down in your heart. How many of, here went to, how many of us here went to, uh, to school and went to college? Raise your hand. You went to school and went to college. Most of you here, right? What happened when you study your textbooks? You study your textbooks, and after you studied, you probably walked around thinking about what you were studying, thinking about what the teacher had told you. You took time to maybe find someone to say, hey, what do you think about this concept? What do you think about this idea? That's the same way we're to handle the Word of God. The same way we spent time with our textbooks, we spent time with whatever we're learning in school, God wants to spend the same time, that same value we place on our study material, place that same value on the Word of God. The same way I got to study and pass this test, the same way you need to get God's word and say, I need God's word so I can live throughout this day. I need God's word so I can survive. I need God's word so I can accomplish this great and magnificent dream that he gave me. This word that he prophesied to me, I need his word so I can get it done. I need his word so that my marriage can thrive. I need his word so my children can thrive. I need his word so my friendships can thrive. I need his word. That's what it means to live off the word of God. The same way you eat that food and we love to eat, the same way I got to get into that word. The same way, you know, growing up, how many of us, we didn't like vegetables? You guys like vegetables? I, didn't, I hated vegetables. I don't like it. And my son doesn't like it either, <laughs> you know. But um, and when I got married to, my, um, to Pastor Fabian, the way she cooked the food, 
my love for vegetables change, just like that. And I see the lesson, okay, you know what? We need to redirect our appetites when it comes to the Word of God. We need to change how we look at it. If you see the Word of God through your upbringing, and your upbringing wasn't the best, you're not going to have a good, relatable experience with the Word of God. If you base the Word of God based on the news, you're not going to have a good, relatable experience with the Word of God. You have to have a mindset that God loves me, God loves me, and the Word that He's spoken is His love letter to me. God loves me, and He has something to say to me in this Word. God loves me, and He has the answer. He has the solution. He has the Word that I need for my body to be healed. He has the Word that I need to thrive and survive. That is how we have to see God's Word. And when we do that, you will see the very value that you're worth. This is why when King David was uh, fighting that war, when he got to the, um, to the battlefield, he said, why is an uncircumcised, uh, an uncircumcised Philistine talking to us like this? We are in covenant with God. We are the children of God. We are the people of God. How dare him have the nerve to talk to us like this? And out of everyone that's there, all this army, it's about maybe 30,000, 40,000 people that's there. He's the only one that could see this. Why? Because he had taken time to see how God's a lover, God's my friend, and God is using his word to, spoken to, me, to speak to me. And I'm going to meditate on what he has declared to me. And because of that, David got that revelation, understanding of who he is in Christ. I mean, not in Christ, who he is in God. And I say that because he, is, he was someone who saw his value. So you're going to see your value in God's word, and you're going to celebrate who you are. Amen? You're going to celebrate what God has declared about you. Too many times we have more knowledge of our sin than we have of Jesus Christ. Too many times we have more knowledge of the circumstances of, or, or the, the, consequences of, the consequences of sin more than we have of God's love for us. I'm not saying don't study consequences. I'm not saying don't look at sin at all. But we need to have a greater understanding of who Christ is because the Bible says as a perfect mirror, as a perfect image, when we look to Christ, we see who we are. I'm paraphrasing that scripture. But when we look to Christ, we're seeing who we are being conformed into that perfect image, being conformed into what he has for us. As you look at Jesus, you see your glory. As you look at Jesus, you see your power. As you look to Jesus, you see who you are in God, in this earth. This is why you have people who, uh, I gave a story about Joshua Belay, the um, African warlord from, um, from, um, from Sierra Leone. Though he was a, 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 a warlock, he was a witch, he practiced witchcraft and he had great demonic power, sacrificing children, all types of things. When he came into contact with Jesus, and though the people saw him as a, a warlord who butchered, who murdered, who killed, when he came in contact with Jesus, all that was put away and he walked in his new identity. And the people, on the, uh, to this day, it was hard for them to receive him as a new man. But he knew for sure he was a new man. He began to walk in that new identity. That's the type of mindset we have to have as believers. I'm born again. I'm righteous. I'm pure. I'm clean. I'm holy. I'm beautiful. I'm a magnet for people. People love me. The grace of God is on my life. The glory of God is on my life, and people are drawn to me. Oh, but what about sins and the mistakes I made? God is saying you have been cleared of all that. You're no, longer, you're no longer condemned. You're no longer guilty. You are forgiven. You are righteous. You are holy. Now, this is, not a, 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 this is not permission to live in sin. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is don't base your identity on your sins. The people in the world live like that. If you're a homosexual, you're a homosexual. You're not saved yet. The people in the world, that's how they, if you're a murderer, you're a murderer. But as a believer, no matter what takes place, you're always a born again child of God. You're always redeemed. You're always clean. You're always holy. You're always pure in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Do we believe that? Do we truly, truly believe that? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to celebrate that God made us just like him. If you were to bring God before you, it'll be looking like it'll be, it, it would be similar to looking in a mirror. You look just like God. You have the attributes. You have the creativity. You have the power. You have the abilities. You have the mindset. Even more, now that you're born again, you have the mind of Christ. You have the creator's mind operating inside you. You have the ability to love the ability to cherish, the ability to grow. You have the ability to do all that Christ has done. That's why he said that those who believe in me, those who look to me, 
they're going to do great work. They're going to do similar works and greater works than I have done. Jesus has that much faith in us that he'll say, he said that they'll do greater works. That is profound. That Jesus said that those who believe in me will do greater as far as quantity is concerned. Not in quality, but as quantity. That's why you have mega churches popping up everywhere. You have people who are raising the dead everywhere. You have people who are doing all types of wonderful works all through the glory of God because they're looking to Jesus. So celebrate how you've been made in Christ. Celebrate how you've been made in Christ. Celebrate that you are holy beings. Celebrate that. Don't look down on that. Don't let people trick you into thinking that's, oh, that's boring. That's corny. This living righteous like that you Christians are. No, no, it's not corny. It's good. It's very good. Uh, I had a dream uh, uh, two nights ago, and inside this dream, I saw a man hopping on one leg at the ATM. I was sitting down watching him. He's pulling out money out the ATM. There are two men. And the reason why I'm bringing out this story to you, there's these two men who are stealing the money from him as he's taking the money out the ATM because he's crippled. And they get the money, and then the man hops off. And I go to them, and I confront them. I said, listen, the evil lifestyle that you guys are living, you're going to bring judgment on yourself. You're going to bring something worse. They were, these were men who were, they were unbelievers. They had no type of thought of compassion. This is inside the dream. The reason why I'm bringing, bringing that up is because there is value to living a righteous, holy lifestyle. There is value of telling people, I am holy, I am pure, I am clean. There is value to saying no to Satan. Could, do you ima could you imagine if Eve would have said no? We would not have been in this, this place. If Eve said, Satan... I don't care what you're saying. I'm like God already. I don't need that. I'm good. We will not be in this position today. Could you imagine how much of the lifestyle that we're living is based on the mistakes and errors of other people? Thank God for our parents, but how much of the wrong that our parents have done have caused us to be where we're at today? And I'm not saying we're going to judge our parents, but I'm saying that to celebrate and to take value that you are holy, you make right decisions. You have the ability to make right decisions. You think righteous thoughts. You are clean. You are good. And you are pure. I had a, a, an experience one time where I was laying down in bed. My wife was in the living room. And lustful thoughts kept coming to me over and over and over. They kept coming and coming. I finally said, Lord, what is wrong with me? Why do I keep lusting? And the Lord said, there's nothing wrong with you. It's a spirit. Tell that spirit to go. I commend the spirit to go. And from that point on, I walk in victory. Every time a lustful thought comes, I said, this is not for me. But you see how Satan almost tricked me, mm -hmm. thinking that it's me? And what happens next? Well, if this is how I am, let me go live in lust. <laughs> you see that? You see, you see, this is why I'm preaching to you, saying to you, celebrate how you've been made. Yes, you're made in the image and likeness of God, but you've now been conformed into the perfect image of Christ as a born-again believer. And it is okay to make righteous decisions. It's okay to say no to drinking. It's okay. Oh, I went to a, um, a baby shower with my brother for his child, and um, they were serving a lot of drinks. And I said in my spirit, you know what, I'm not going to drink. I'm a man of God. And they don't know I'm a man of God. Only my brother does. His friends, a lot of them don't know my lifestyle. They don't know how I'm really about that life when it comes to living this way. But I said, I'm not going to drink today. I'm good. Did you know that there was someone scheduled to pray, but this person was afraid to pray for whatever reason? So in front of all these people, but maybe about 100 to 150 people, they called upon me to pray. Could you imagine what would have happened if I was taking a drink? And I'm, I'm up there praying, <laughs> excuse me, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> like just, you, and this is why it's so valuable to say no to sin. Because God will use you to win the souls of people. I have a, because of my lifestyle, I have a friend, um, and this ball means so much to us. It's called a dribble up, dribble, a dribble up ball. It's a ball where uh, with the, uh, the iPhone or iPad, it could train your child how to kick the ball in soccer. I have a friend who is a, a, a Muslim. He learns about my lifestyle. He's dealing with uh, 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 multiple personality disorder and um, that other stuff starts with an S. Yes, yeah, thank you. I didn't want to say it. So I, <laughs> anyway, um, I don't want to make a mistake on the word, but he comes to me one day and um, we're in, he's in the park playing with his son. Patrick, come. No, first I pray for him. 
I said, you're dealing with this stuff. Let me pray for you. I pray for him. Uh, next year, um, uh, um, I, t- I, t- I pray for him. I tell him I'm a pastor. Then the next year he said, listen, my wife is having trouble having kids. Can you please come and pray for her? Sure, no problem. I, um, but in doing that, he says, I have something for your son. Come and I'm going to give this gift to your son. I said, sure, I'll do it. I go to meet him. I made a mistake now where I ministered to his wife and I prayed for her. And that was a mistake because I first did not find out if she was saved or not. Now, prior to praying for her, she never had a miscarriage. She never got pregnant. Nothing happened at all. He called me several weeks ago, the week before we met. He said, listen, I need you to, I'm trying to be a cop. I need you to fill out this form for me and, and tell them some good things about me. Sure, I'll do it. But he can't make it because there's a change in our schedule because we have a meeting. So his wife comes. And the wife said, listen, um, I, do the, I do the form. She said, I just want to tell you that after you prayed for me, I had two miscarriages. I never had miscarriage before until you prayed for me. So she's talking to me, but this time I didn't make the, the same mistake before. I said, before we can even talk about miscarriages, I have to talk to you about your soul. Are you saved? Are you born again? I began to explain to her the salvation process. And she said, I never heard it like this before. And I said, it's simple. You, you're facing life. You are, you are going to be sentenced to life. You're standing before the judge right now. You're about to go. And Jesus walks in the courtroom and says, I'll take her place. That's exactly what took place with you. And she said, wow. So we prayed on the street. And while the kids are playing, Jeremiah and Mackenzie kept running back and forth. Fabian's waiting at home for me. We have a meeting. We're going go, go, we're gonna, we're gonna to go meet with some people. I'm running late, but I said, I have to, I have to win this soul. And um, I told her, uh, we, we did the salvation prayer. And she said, I felt something into my heart. And I feel all this heat around me. I said, good. So she got saved, and then we began to pray for her. But I didn't touch her because I didn't want to bring attention around because there's a lot of people in the park. I just want to just, let me just, let me just pray for her. She put her hands on her stomach. She prayed. I haven't gotten, and mind you, her husband is Muslim, but I haven't gotten the, the, the word back yet, but I know that she's going to get pregnant now that we, we rectified this part. The reason why I'm bringing this up to you is because my friend saw my lifestyle and was drawn to it. When I'm preaching on social media, these guys, you'd be shocked how many people were uh, unbelievers. Yo, Patrick, I need that word again. Yo, Patrick, I remember how you were like this, and it's just amazing to see that. Keep preaching that word. Uh, one person said, yo, man, stay consistent this time, man. Stop stopping and going. I said, okay, I'm going to do that. <laughs> but my lifestyle is, so when we say live holy, right, my God, the eternal significance of your lifestyle is so so, so valuable. So when I say you're holy, when I say you're pure, I'm saying it because that you will not be like some of these inmates. When we were growing up, there were some kids from the hood where they liked going to prison. That's the weirdest thing in the world, man. I'm telling you, they enjoyed it. Yeah, man, I'm going back. Man, I can't wait to get back inside. And that's how you, you see some of you are shaking your head like, man, that's crazy, right? That's weird. But that's how we act as believers. Yeah, man, I'm going to go back into that sexual bondage, man. Yeah, he delivered me, but I'm going to go have some more fun. Just a few. And I'm going to go back and smoke some weed. I'm going to go back to lying. I'm going to go back to stealing. And I'm saying that to encourage you that if you don't celebrate your value, you're going to easily go back into those things. So be proud. Be proud of who you are in Christ. Be happy. Be joyful of who you are in Christ. Be excited that you are a light. Be excited that this world is getting darker and people need you more than ever. You'll be shocked about what people are going through. You'll be shocked. My son goes to school and the story that he comes home with are shocking of what some of these kids are doing. Now, I knew it too. As a child, we knew of kids who are going through abuse. Kids who, and as a kid, you don't know better. You make fun of kids and they come home, they, they come to school smelling like urine because you did not know what their lifestyle was like at home. You didn't know better as a child. I really regret those, those things, doing those things. But, but um, uh, now that my son is there, I'm encouraging him. You're now a light. And I'm going to encourage you, celebrate your value of being holy. Celebrate your value of being pure. 
Celebrate your value of being a soul winner. Celebrate your value that you have the anointing, and when you lay hands on someone, they're going to be set free. Celebrate your value that you have the wisdom of God working in you, and you are a financial powerhouse. Celebrate your value that you have the wisdom to make right decisions because you are a born-again believer. I told the Lord the other day, I said, I'm amazed at how brilliant your people are. Christians are brilliant. You see what's going on in Africa, all the, um, the, the, the economic boom? You'll be shocked to find many believers at the forefront of that, uh, what's going on on that continent. You'll be shocked to find what's happening. What, you, you, if you really take time to watch all the videos and look, many of these guys are believers. That's how brilliant the believer is. And we're going to celebrate how brilliant we are in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The next thing I want to bring to you is Luke chapter 15. This is a story about the prodigal son. In Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son goes to his father and says, listen, I'm his two brothers. He gets to his father and says, um, dad, uh, the younger brother said, give me the portion or give me my wealth right now. The father says, sure. He takes his wealth and he leaves. The Bible says he leaves and he, he lives a wasteful, wasteful lifestyle. So wasteful to the point where he gets to, the, he gets to a place where he's in a pig pen. Sin will have you doing crazy things. He gets to the pig pen and he's, he's considering eating what the pigs are eating. You see how deadly sin is? You see what Satan wants to do? He wants to make you look like a beast, like a dog. Yeah, come on, have some fun. You don't really care about your fun. He cares about your bondage. I need you separated from the father. I get you separated from the father. We're good because I'm trying to get to him, but I can't get to him, but I'm going to get to you. You see that? So this son goes and he's living, he comes, the Bible says that he comes to himself. There's a, uh, I want to take a side note on that. Um, there's a, Pastor Reese, I, I pray God that one day he teaches it to you about the, the, the negative effects of lying to yourself. That's a teaching that we need to hear as a people. But um, the Bible said he came to himself. He began to say, why am I living like this? Now, though he began to recognize his value slightly, he didn't recognize it fully. Because the Bible says this. He said, I'm going to go back to my dad. I'm going to tell him I lived as a sinner. And I'm going to tell my dad to make me one of your hired servants. That's insanity. <laughs> Could you imagine Christopher doing that to us? <laughs> Could I you? Yo, my brother, I, had, I messed up big time. Make me like your maid. <laughs> okay. All who are parents here, could you imagine your child coming? <laughs> no, shit. We have to take time to think about how depraved did. Now, he got, he, got, <laughs> he got humbled, but really he entered into a very bad place because of prodigal living. So humbled that he began to see, he began to be in shame. And he wasn't proud enough of who he was anymore. I keep going back to this, but this is why, this is how dangerous sin can be. Yeah. It'll make you live a shameful, unwanted lifestyle that when people are coming to you, oh, I don't want to be around you. And there's nothing that they've done, it's because of how you see, you perceive yourselves. Yeah. So this is why we're going to go back and celebrate your value. But going back to this, the son, he, um, he goes back to his father, and I loved it, what happened to him. He said, I love when he got to his father in verse 21, of Luke chapter 15, verse 21. I'm sorry if I'm going, going, going. Um, and the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Now, you know, naturally speaking, if, in order for you to, to disown your child legally, you have to go through the court process. I'm not sure if you guys know that. You have to actually go to court and have the court go through the process of doing that. But that's what he's doing, basically. He's trying to go. He's trying to say, I'm no longer worthy. And, and, and when you see me from now on, you're going to see me as a hired servant. But I love what the father did. The father cut him off. He didn't even let him finish. He didn't let, he didn't let him, he just said, he's quiet. And he responded in 22. But the father said to his son, let me actually read. He said, I'm no longer worthy to call your son. Verse 22. But the father said to his servant. So he's coming to his dad. He's telling his dad, I'm no longer worthy. Right? This is my, my dad. I'm no longer worthy. The dad turns to him, get me the, get me the robe. Let's throw a party. My son is home. He did not even address his feelings of unworthiness. He did not even address how he felt about himself. Man, shut up. Come, let's, party. let's have a party. My son who is lost is now found. Come on. And not only that, he said that 
He was dead, but now he's alive again. Yes. Celebrate that you are alive in Christ. Hallelujah. You're not the walking dead. Jesus. You're not living a hopeless lifestyle. You're not headed for destruction. Hallelujah. You're not one who's going to die in a hospital decrepit. I went to, into the physical, really spiritual, but, uh, but let me go there. You're not one who's going to die by brain aneurysm, by cancer. Because of the spiritual life that is in you, it transcends into the physical life. So you are walking, living revival. You are walking, living life. You exude life. I remember when I was at the bank and I was a believer and the managers, these guys, they loved me. I'm talking about, in fact, let me make it clear to you so you can understand how significant it was. These are regional managers. These are not just your branch managers. These are guys who are over regions. And I would walk in there and they said, man, every time you come in, we feel light. We feel good. We feel like you bring the sun with you. That's one of the things that, I forgot her name was, uh, uh, I forgot, oh man, she was a sweet woman, but, but these were regional managers. Why? Because the life of Christ, of me being alive, of me having living waters coming from me, was being expressed outside. And that is what you are to celebrate. That you are, when you walk into your home, you bring life. There was a woman, uh, she was raised in a, a partly Catholic household, partly sat satanic um, uh, household. When I say satanic, where her family did some satanic worship practices while being Catholic. This woman goes and gets married to a husband or to a man who is a, a full-fledged Satan worshiper in Puerto Rico. They have a kid together. She baptizes the child in, um, in a satanic, I mean, in a, in a Catholic temple. The father's family baptizes the child in a satanic temple. This woman, mind you, does not know everything that she doesn't understand. She's just living life on autopilot. The Bible said they walk. The people who are dead are walking according to the course of this world. You'll find that people are just doing things just to do them and having no full thought of understanding of what they're doing. They're just doing these things. But um, she, so she, 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 so. At this point, she realizes that life is not as good. I'm being abused. Uh, I don't feel happy. My child is one year old, and for some reason, he's not talking. He's not walking. He's not crawling. Thing that a one-year-old should be doing. Eventually, she meets a man in a coffee shop, a Colombian born-again believer, business owner. And when I met this man, it felt alive. I felt alive. I don't know, something about him, and he began to tell me about Jesus every day. She said that um, it came to the point where I would come early, I would clean up the coffee shop so I can have that 15 minutes where he tell me, just talking about Jesus. He said, and then one particular day, he told me Jesus died, in three days he rose. And she said, he died? He came back to life again? She was shocked. The man went away crying. And she thought she did something wrong. And she, he came back and said, why are you crying? He said, because I am reminded again that there are people in this world who have never heard the gospel. Long story short, he ministers to her. She gives her life to Christ. Then he has a vision, this man. I see your son in a cage. He's bound in a cage. What's going on with your son? Wow. Well, you know, when he was a child, we, we dedicated him or we baptized him in a satanic temple. This is what you need to do. Plead the blood of Jesus. Pray over him. She did that for one week. Instantly, her child was healed. Just like that. He talked. He's, he's talk, and actually, he went from, from, from not move, not crawling, not talking, not walking, to fully walking. And you know anything about children, they don't do that. It's mostly crawled and walk. But I want to bring out that this man had life exuding from him that this unbeliever felt it and was drawn to it. This is why we have to celebrate that we are alive. The Bible says that you were dead in sin. You were dead walking according to the course of this world. You were dead. You, you say you, you, these people, these pornographers having fun, they're dead. These drug dealers having fun, they're dead. These mafiosos having fun, they all, all of them are dead. And you, and let's get to something that's right. If you're not a believer, you are the walking dead. And, but this woman met someone who's a believer who was alive and she could feel that. And you ought to celebrate that, that you have living, eternal life coming from you. You have a living, eternal life comfort. I'm going, I'm taking time. Because why do we celebrate LeBron James? Why do we celebrate him? He scored and he does all types of things, right? 
Why do we celebrate? Who's some, who's some of your favorite um, celebrities? Right? Who has celebrities here? Oh, everybody's quiet now. They, they, nobody, nobody got celebrities? Huh? Huh? Cardi B's your celebrity. Who's, who's your celebrity? Who's your favorite celebrity? You don't got none? You, don't, you guys have nobody that you like out there? Liars. Who you got? Who you got? Huh? Kanye you like Kanye West? Who else you like? Who you like? You like Michael Jordan. Oh, man, that kid is strong, man. Michael Jordan. The reason why I'm bringing that because you like them because there's some type of value that they have that they are shared with this world. Kanye West is super creative. Cardi B, um, she went from being a stripper to now she's married, driving Rolls Royces. I'm, I'm bringing this out for a reason. Beyonce, with, with, with her pretty self, whatever she's doing, she's doing. Right? <laughs> actually, no, you know, let me take that back. She's very talented, actually. Talented and very smart. But I'm bringing these out for a reason. If the world had enough common sense to recognize the, the value of these celebrities, to recognize the value that they add to this world, and they celebrate it, how much more when we have living life inside of us? How much more when we have the God of all of heaven giving us dreams, giving us visions, giving up his spirit, proving to us who we are? How much more are we to celebrate that living life that's inside of us? Remember I brought it out earlier, Eve, thank, thank you, Eve looked to what she thought she didn't have. And as a believer, if you make the mistake to look at yourself and despise yourself, you are going to miss it. My son, um, I asked him for permission to share this story. So I'm going to share this story with you. He woke up one morning. My wife and I were talking to him. And as he's talking, he doesn't want to go to school. He's crying a little bit. But it's, not a, it's just a little tear in his eye. So we're trying to talk to him. Like, you got to go to school. There's nobody going to be home. You got to go to school. <laughs> Finally, I said, listen, man, you're responsible at your age to tell us what's going on. No more of this. I need to know what's happening. You got to talk. I'm not going to keep chasing you. Finally, he tells me, I, I go to school and no one likes me. No, no one's talking. I'm sorry, what? No one's talking to you. Sorry. Oh, no, no, sorry. The kids that he, the kids that he likes, the kids that he wants to be friends with, they're not talking to him. So I'm like, bro, is there anybody else talking to you? Yeah. Like, well, what, about, what about those kids? I know they, they talking, about. I want these kids to talk to me. So I said, no, 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 we're not doing that. You go to school, focus on the kids who like you. Focus on the kids who spoke to you. I go there, I'm concerned. I go to pick him up and I'm watching from the side. He comes out to school happy. Hey, what's up, man? He's running around, you know, kitty giddy. So I call him up, he, uh, like, let's hang out. I said, how was school today? Oh, man, it was awesome, Dad, you was right. I just focused on the kids who spoke to me and I had a great and awesome day. Wow. You see the... <laughs> you, you see the power when you shift your focus? You see that? You see what happens when you change the way you look at things? When you change how you see yourself? He began to say, wait a minute, people do like me, and he focused on the good. So you have to focus on that. Now listen, I'm saying, uh, I, I want to be clear. I know that's, um, th that's the better way of saying it. It's okay to improve yourself. We're not talking about self-improvement. We're talking about our identity in Christ. One second, let me, let me unflow. We're talking about our identity in Christ. We're talking about who we are in Christ. That's who we're talking about. So go ahead and improve yourself. Go ahead and get better. Read the books. But besides that, make sure you celebrate and focus who you are in Christ. Amen? Please. And you are alive. The next thing I want to bring to you is that you're not only alive. I mentioned this before. You are guiltless. Man, New York is not a real place. Let me tell you why. <laughs> what? What? There was a time where... John Gotti of the Mafia was walking around here celebrating who he was. Mm. And the man didn't, I, I don't think he understood how evil works. Evil is not meant to be paraded, it's meant to be shrouded. Yes. And he was, yeah, I'm the Teflon Don. They said at one point he's in a restaurant in there, he's signing autographs. And they're looking at him like, you're, you're the boss of the biggest crime family in New York in 1993, I mean, in the 80s and 90s. In the 80s and 90s was rough, New York was a different place. And you were parading this type of thing. It was so bad that other families wanted to kill him because he was making the lifestyle glamorous. And it wasn't meant to be a glamorous lifestyle. It's meant to be a lifestyle of we're tough, we're mean. He had homeless people calling him out. But the reason why I'm bringing it out because three separate times, 
The federal government found him not guilty. Three separate times, and each time they were celebrating this. I mean, you have people in the courtroom, yay, good John Gotti. He gets outside the courtroom, they're shouting his name, the press. They're cheering him on, not guilty. Yeah, we knew you weren't guilty. I mean, people are dumb. <laughs> I, mean, I don't mean to say it like that, but you, you take time to think about it, you're celebrating evil. But if this man can celebrate that he is not guilty by the federal government, that he does not have to go to jail, how much more are we who God has declared that we are guiltless, that there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ? That's how we are to live. That's how we are to celebrate. We are guiltless. Now, just to um, close with that story with John Gotti, he eventually got found guilty. He died in prison, a very horrible death. You know, actually, a priest came to him on his deathbed. He said no. He didn't want the priest to pray. He, he was true to his self. I mean, that was stupid, but true to himself, you know. But um, the reason I bring, I bring the story because... This man celebrated his not guilty verdict. And you have to celebrate your not guilty. When someone comes and condemns you, I'm not guilty. When your friends or family or you yourself, if the Bible says even when your heart condemns us, condemns you, God is greater than your heart. No, no, I'm, I am guiltless. I am set free. I am not bound. I am not condemned. I am righteous. I am pure. That is how you to celebrate. It's okay to have godly sorrow, but you're not to declare yourself guilty. You're not to declare yourself unwanted. You're not to declare yourself destined for death. Destined. I don't care what you have done. You are not the person who's going to die early. You're not the person who's going to be judged by God. I know we're living in a world where there's tell people are telling people that, oh, this uh, type of evil that's happening or this happened, or uh, you may see like a natural disaster. Oh, that's God's judgment. Listen. We got to understand we're living in an age of grace where God is hungry. God is pursuing. God is desiring souls. I don't care what Israel is doing. Oh, they, they, we're going to kill these Palestinians. God has hope for the Palestinian people. Actually, he has hope for both for both nations. And if it was God, if it was up to God, he wouldn't want these people bombing each other. He wouldn't want genocide. I know there's a lot of Christians, no, no, this is, this is what God wants for the Jews. No, no listen, that was old covenant. When, it, when Jesus came, all that changed. Everyone is required to receive the not guilty verdict. Everyone's required to receive it by believing in Jesus Christ. And God desires to hand out not guilty verdicts. He's a judge who is smiling, laughing, happy. Here, not guilty. Here, not guilty. Here, not guilty. Not guilty for you. Anyway, 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 getting one. Not guilty for you. Even the man outside, not guilty for you. I don't care who you are, where are you from. Everyone, not guilty. Amen? And that's to be celebrated. If you don't celebrate, this is the power of celebration. This is the power of seeing all the good things that God has given you. The last point I want to bring out to you, I love this scripture. It comes from Colossians chapter 1. And it says in verse 19. Oh, I realize I don't have it in this note. But he said in Colossians chapter 1 that... We have been delivered from the power of darkness and conveyed. 11 to 13. Let me read it. I think it's good if you hear it. Um, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. We have been delivered. We have been delivered. God wants us to celebrate our deliverance. We're not bound to depression, and I don't have anything against depressed people. And I, sometimes when, when ministers talk, we, we, we misinterpret what, what they're trying to say. I'm not trying to be, um, uh, I'm very sympathetic for anybody struggling, but depression does not have more power than the son, the kingdom of the son of his love. Suicide does not have more power than Jesus. The Bible says you were taken out of prison, out of bondage, out of addiction, and transferred into a, a higher place. Yes. So really depression, suicide, uh, heart attacks, any type of darkness, any type of evil thoughts, they are beneath you. When um, Joshua Belay, when I told you a story about the African warlord, he, says, he said when he saw Jesus, this is what Jesus said to him. He said, he, 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 he's this way. 
He turns around, he sees Jesus in the air. At this time, as an African warlord, as a witch, he does not know it's Jesus. And Jesus is there, and he said something so profound to him. I want you to catch what he said. This man is a witch, a witch doctor, a, 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 a satanic priest. And Jesus said this to him, the one who sits on your shoulder is your slave, but he's acting as your master. He's supposed to be under your feet. Repent and live, refuse and die. And the man was confused, like, what? He said, yeah, this man, who's, this evil spirit, this demon who's telling you to kill, telling you to destroy, telling you to do all, these, all types of evil things, he is supposed to be your slave, but he is your master. Jesus said these words to him. Jesus was basically telling him, this, giving the scriptures to him that you have been delivered from the power of darkness. That's why he said that in Ephesians chapter 2, it talks about this glorious thing that God did with Jesus. After Jesus died, he raised him up. I mean, in, in chapter 1, he talks about, at, at the end of chapter 1, he raised him up. And in chapter 2, this is what God did for Jesus, but this is what he did with you. He then made you alive, and he placed you inside of Christ. So all things that are dark, all things that are evil, everything that pertains to Satan is under your feet. But it's not just under. The Bible says that you are far above oh, it. Come on, come on. You are far above it. Hallelujah. If we catch that revelation, that understanding that we are far above, my God, your life will be completely different. Amen. Poverty will have no place in your life. Hallelujah. Bad spending habits will have no place in your life. Sexual sins will have no place because you are placed above these things. That's why he said that when a, when a righteous man goes back to his sin, it's like a dog returning back to his vomit. It's showing you how low and depressing these things are and how far above you are, uh, um, how far above you are with these things. You are far above anything that is dark, anything that is evil, anything that is wicked. Therefore, I don't need to be afraid of a witch doctor. I don't be afraid of a voodoo priest. I don't be afraid of the guy who's practicing rituals. <laughs> yeah, you know, I had my stepfather. He went to Sierra Leone, and they put some stuff in his skin for protection. You know where my stepfather is now? He's walking like this. Really messed up. I don't mean to mock him. But he went to Sierra Leone. My mom told me he went to Sierra Leone. He got all this stuff put in his skin, all these marks. This stuff is real. I mean, we're from, people from Africa know, know these things, or people from the Caribbean know he practiced all types of all these types of evil in his body, and yet he he, he still lost. He still his mind is still um, getting worse. So what was the point of going to the witch doctor? Yeah, they have, they have no power. They're just agents of destruction. The goal is to destroy you. That's it. Yeah, I need you. To, I need you away from God. Come hang out with me for a little bit. Come enjoy yourself over here. Get away from God. God is boring. But no, those things are beneath you. You are far above those things. Hallelujah. And I love what it said because there's a, I, I'm not against prayer, but sometimes as believers, we're praying for a reality that already exists. We're praying for a reality that we're already supposed to be walking in. And I'm, I'm not saying don't pray, but the problem is there's a lack of understanding many times with who we are. And this is why we, we become victims and so we have these questions, oh, why did this Christian die? And why did that happen to this Christian? Many times there's a lack of understanding. And I pray in the name of Jesus that you will understand what I said to you today. Amen. That you will celebrate who you are in Christ. Yes. You will celebrate you are alive and you're not dead. That you will celebrate that you have been delivered from the power of darkness. You have been delivered from the power of darkness. Let's get some, let me bring some, a, a natural thing. A, a doctor, what does he do to become a doctor? He learns. He understands. He studies. And why does he practice medicine? Because the state or whoever, the authority that be, have qualified him to be a person who knows what he's doing based on his knowledge. So therefore, if the doctor has to study, how much does the believer have to study who or she, she is in Christ? How much of the believer have to take time to read the Bible and receive what God is saying? Come to church and receive what the man of God is saying. How much more does the believer? If this world works by common sense, how much more the Christian life? How much more we need Christian understanding of the doctrines, of the principles of the word of God? 
And I'm saying this to encourage you, please, when you leave this place, don't let it just be another Sunday. No, go away understanding who you are in Christ. You are a powerhouse. There was a man, there was a man who, as a witch, or as a, say, whatever he was doing in New York City, he was practicing witchcraft, and he would go around the city causing car accidents all over the place, going into people's homes, doing astral projection, all types of nonsense and evil. But when he saw a group of believers praying on the corner, he could not touch that place. He says, as a matter of fact, when I saw them, I saw nothing but light. That's what he saw. If you can see who you are in the spirit realm, it will blow your mind away. So I want to encourage you about who you are. Now, I want to give you something as well because uh, uh, it's, it's Satan comes through suggestion. Psychologists call it, a, a psychologist say there's a thing called positive suggestion and negative suggestion. Negative suggestion has the power to make you exhibit behaviors that are destructive. I'm bringing this out to you because Satan can only suggest. That's all he can do. What about this? What about that? Look at this. He's going to suggest. He cannot force anything upon you, neither can he command you. He is not in within the parameters to command anything from your life. He's not in the parameters to put anything on you. All he can do is suggest. All you need to do is believe or reject. This world works also by believing. The more Whatever you believe, that's what's going to happen for you. You believe in Satan's lies, it's going to happen. You believe in the truth of God's word, it's going to happen. I'm bringing this out because I want you to leave this place believing and understanding who you are in Christ. 2024 is going to be a great and amazing year. It will be a year of dynamic power in the name of Jesus. 2023 will end well in the name of Jesus Christ. You will see things that you're not used to seeing. You will walk in things that you're not used to walking in because of God's dynamic power at work in your life. 2024 will be a year of triumph and victory. I don't care if it feels bad or if it doesn't feel right. You are still required and you are still being blessed and empowered to walk in victory. I don't care how many times something has not worked out. You as a believer are powerful. You as a believer are great. You as a believer are holy. You are pure. You are righteous. You are clean. You are a powerhouse to this world in Jesus' name. I don't care what you have done in your past. This is your moment and time and season of bringing hope to the world. I don't care what decision you made yesterday. You are qualified to bring hope. You are qualified to bring truth. You are qualified to invite your friends to church. You are qualified to walk them through the steps. You are qualified to pray for them. You are qualified to help them. You are qualified because of your value in Christ Jesus, because of the value that God has given you. 2024 will be a year of great impact for you. You'll be impactful. You'll be irresistible. Your significance is going to grow in Jesus' precious name. The knowledge of God's word is going to expand your thinking. It's going to expand your understanding. You're going to do things that the Bible says you're going to do great exploits because you know who you are or you know, you know who, you, who God is. As you know who God is, you're going to know who you are and you're going to, you're going to do great exploits in Jesus' name. The Bible didn't say small exploits. It said great exploits. And I'm not just talking to you, I'm talking to me as well. I've already challenged myself and I've already declared, man, 2024 is going to be different because of the knowledge of his word has come inside inside of me and it has expanded my thinking and 2024 will not be regular for me in Jesus' name. And in the same way, it won't be regular for you. With, With every head bow, if you are not born again,